Hello everyone and uh, welcome along to episode two of the new uh, vegan time tunnel. So um, today we're looking at this, which is the animals film. Um, that's the DVD uh, version, 26 years after it first came out, I believe. So in terms of the, uh, of the series, the idea is for week on week, we're going to hopefully put together a kind of archive of some of the most significant things that have happened in the animal advocacy movement. And so it should build up week after week and then become, you know, an archive for people to, as it were, explore the history of our movement, which is obviously very important. Okay, without further ado, then let's go with the time tunnel. So the animals film, I suppose um, <clears throat> the first thing we could say about the animals fil <clears throat> film is that it's kind of my generation's earthlings, I suppose. It had a, a really big effect uh, when it came out. Um, it's a film from 1981 and it was created by Victor Schoenfeld and also um, Miriam uh, Allure as well. And so um, it was a big deal uh, as, as I said, when it came out. So we're going to go through a few a few of the things about the film. I'm going to show you an edited version of the trailer. I've kind of tried to cut out. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to cut out the bit that might get us, um, get us with, with a copyright uh, strike. But I've also tried, tried to cut out a bit of the, the more gruesome stuff. But it's not too bad. But I will kind of give you... Um, a warning um, about that, if you like. So um, there's that to come. So the animals film then. <clears throat> so what we've got here is um, the DVD, um, that uh, picture above me, that's the one I've just shown you. So that's the DVD and the, the poster for the DVD is, um, is the one in the middle. Uh, really the one to the right is the, how it looked when it came out in uh, VHS form, which is videotape. Um, I suppose there might some, be some people um, nowadays who don't know what VHS means. It stands for Video Home System. So, um, yes. Well, I mean, we're going to go back to film as well in the sense that um, when we showed it in Liverpool, it was 16 millimeter film. So the story starts in 1977 when Victor Schoenfeld was in New York and he was part of something called the New York Political Film Group. And he said that he was interested in using what he calls cinematic language to challenge habitual thinking. And so he conceived the idea of the animals film. He said that he thought that through cinema, then he could make people feel a, a different way. I'm going to talk a little bit about his rationale because they insisted on it being released in theatres before it was released eventually to, to TV. And so Schoenfeld conceived the animals film as a consciousness raising event, really. It's quite long. It's over two hours. So it's kind of, kind of a long uh, event, if you like. The music is by Robert Wyatt. In fact, um, I still have my original soundtrack LP which runs both sides, runs to 28 minutes. So it's uh, quite short in that sense. Um, and then also the title song, which is the bit that's cut out of the trailer, which is why a lot of it is going to be silent, uh, was by Talking Heads. And it was called Mind. And um, you see there right at the bottom corner, I need something to change your mind, which is one of the refrains of the film. And of course, um, the song as well. So the idea was to use cinema to challenge uh, ways that people, you know, think about things. And he wanted to release it in cinemas first. And in the DVD version, which has got a really good interview with Victor Schoenfeld, he explains the rationale and he says there's a big difference between watching a film, as it were, in the dark pay for a ticket, you go in, and that's a different experience than watching something 
on TV or nowadays watching something streamed when people will be kind of taking a break, making a cup of tea, this kind of stuff. And so he thought that the cinematic experience would be really powerful because in a, in a kind of weird sense, people are a little bit trapped uh, there because they're, you know, in, in a cinema with a lot of other people. So that's the kind of rationale. Uh, the film industry itself was rather shocked by the idea of putting out a full-length documentary um, at the time, although it's it's quite common now. I mean, you might think of, um, you know, the documentaries by people like Michael Moore, for example. And so in that sense, it's not a, an unusual thing now, but it was then. In fact, one of the things about the, the Animals film is it's quite groundbreaking uh, in that sense. Now, this is interesting because, um, as many of you might know, I used to be a projectionist, and um, this is the quad. So these, this size of poster uh, was called a quad in the cinema business, and so this was the one that used to go outside uh, theatres. And um, the person holding it is uh, Kim Stallwood, who we met last time in the... Um, <laughs> I'm getting commentary from behind. Um, in the first uh, time tunnel about the vivisection uh, movement in Britain. And so he's uh, holding his signed and also um, framed edition of uh, the quad. It was an AA film. So in modern day, that would probably mean an, a 15 uh, rating. Sean Feld found a radio personality to fund it. Uh, she had two flats in New York City, uh, one of which was apparently used exclusively for the stray cats that she looked after. And so she offered to fund the film. And Shunfield said that she actually said, look, um, I don't want you to go around begging people for a lot of money, you know, lots of different people. So tell me how much it's going to be and I'll pay for all of it. And so that's what the agreement was. So they came up with a, an initial budget of $68,000. Uh, but um, Schoenfeld said that in actual fact, in the end, it was about 10 times that. So it was a lot a bigger thing than they kind of knew that they were getting into because everyone in, in this adventure was kind of breaking ground. You know, uh, this film shows some scenes that have never been shown before but also, the, you know, the filmmaking technique and the people involved, this was the first time that they they did it. Now, my first involvement with this is back in Liverpool. I was part of something called the Merseyside Animal Rights Committee. And uh, we showed the film in a public showing at, at this place, which is called the Blue Coat Chambers, which is in Liverpool. And so uh, you go up that ramp in the middle there, you turn right, and there's kind of like a, a place where you can show uh, films. So that was our first um, engagement with the film. We had a 16 millimeter um, copy uh, that was sent to us in order to do that. And uh, when I was advertising this um, time tunnel, there's quite a lot of people commenting, oh, yeah, we showed it in here, we showed it that, you know. And so that's that's how it came. So it was... It was official cinema first, then these kind of independent cinemas, and then the TV. So a year later, we're up to 82, and this is when Channel 4, which was a brand new TV uh, station in Britain, uh, launched. And so they decided to show the Animals film um, in their first week. And in fact, it was on their third night um, of broadcasting, which is November the 4th. And the audience was estimated at over a million people, which was pretty good. And um, November the 4th, they didn't know it at the time, but they released it during World Vegan Month, which was quite neat. But World Vegan Month didn't exist back in those days. So Jonathan Por um, Porrett, who was a very well-known environmentalist, I think he's a lord now, and also David Winner, who is an author, they write that with over 1 million viewers, the screening is regarded as, quote, an important moment in the growth of public awareness of animal exploitation. And so, it, as I said, it was a pretty big deal uh, back in the day in the sense that people were seeing footage 
that they'd never ever seen before. This, this was kind of groundbreaking uh, in that sense. It was also shown again on uh, Channel 4 during, um, what was it, 1991. And they had a, a, a series going back in their own history um, and they called it Band. And so the Animals film was re-shown uh, again. So the original um, film is 136 minutes long. And um, as I said, it was released in cinemas with the AA certificate. There was no cuts at all in terms of the, the one that went out to the theatres uh, because the British Board of Film Classification, which used to be called the British Board of Film Censors, uh, gave it the, the AA um, signage, which meant that you know nobody young would, would see it, as it were. When it came to the TV, though, it was it was different. The independent broadcasting authority were worried about some scenes, and so they called Sean Fell in, and there was a negotiation about some scenes should be cut. Now, the scenes they wanted to cut, you would have thought would be the graphic thing showing animal use, right? It, it wasn't that. It was they wanted to cut some scenes involving animal activists. And so they were worried that the film was so powerful and so kind of persuasive that this was a real moral problem that it could incite crime or, e or even lead to civil disorder or kind of promote the idea that uh, this is so bad that direct action is therefore justified. So that was the, the rationale. The film was so devastating that illegal activities would as, as it would be justified, and it might even prompt them. So in the end, uh, Schoenfeld did uh, agree to cut about seven minutes, which was mainly at the end. In the DVD version, you do get the original, uh, and then you get a, no, a new director's cut as well as some little extras. A Geraldine Buck, a prize-winning author, uh, said in 1982, uh, that some scenes from the animals film will stay with her forever. And she writes, quote, the film ends with a desperate optimism. There is footage of the British Animal Liberation Front's raids on research establishments and sabotage of hunts. Slightly wrong, but it doesn't really matter. After watching two hours of appalling atrocities, the only appropriate response to the ALF criminal activities is a rousing and prolonged cheer. So that's what the film censors were a little bit worried about. And the, the TV people were worried about in the sense that that was, you know, coming out in the reviews from the journalists, kind of like, you know, go for it type thing. And so they decided then that they'd have to have some cuts. And so reluctantly, Schoenfeld agreed that seven minutes will be cut. But in terms of the rest of it, it was shown on TV uh, in full all at once with no ad breaks. So again, that was fairly uh, unusual. It features quite a lot of um, cartoons and interviews and uh, adverts to, to break the film up. And Sean Phil talks about that as well in the DVD interview in the sense that they didn't want it to be relentless. And the animals film is seen as not as relentless as something like Earthlings or Dominion, in the sense that they deliberately broke it up uh, using other other bits, you know, like, um, as I said, cartoons and stuff. In fact, you'll see a couple of examples of the cartoon in, in the trailer, which I'm going to show you now. So in terms of content warning for the trailer, I've cut the um, sound quite a lot. So a lot of this is um, silent. And um, I've also cut a couple of visual scenes but there still are scenes involving uh, chicks on a conveyor belt. There is a really weird, seems to be an advert or a promotional film for the um, what the uh, turtle soup business, which uh, really indicates you know attitudes at the time. And you would think nowadays that um, you know the industry would would have known not to talk in those terms. And then right at the end, there's a little bit of footage of uh, monkeys uh, being experimented on, but the, it's not particularly graphic. But the, the interesting thing is what the narrator is saying. So let's see if we can put this on. 
So this is how the film starts, but the the, the kind of talking heads uh, music is uh, on at this stage. This is the bit I've cut out because I thought we might get into some copyright uh, problems. As I said, again, you've got to think that some of these, that's, that's an example of the cartoon, some of these scenes had never really been seen before, you know, certainly not in cinemas and then later in TV. Use this bat here for loading out boards. If you get two boards fighting, they can cut themselves up pretty good with it. And I go through and I bust their noses. And usually, after you bust their nose, it gives them something else to think about. And you got a terrible view about fur now. I would take a dim view of making a purchase of fur coat. If I gave it any clue, I just eliminate it from my mind. Yeah, I always remember that scene where oh, I just eliminated it from my mind. In fact, there is another scene involving some teenage kids, and uh, one of them was saying, "Well, as long as I didn't see it, I, I will, I will eat flesh, you know, but I, I wouldn't want to see it being produced, kind of thing." And of course, we still still get that kind of uh, issue nowadays, don't we? So it's uh, it's kind of as it were known to us. Don't underrate the strength of the vested interests of various kinds, agricultural, scientific, and particularly in the chemical and the pharmaceutical industries, and especially, of course, factory farming. So that voice there was Lord Dow uh, no, it was uh, Lord Houghton, uh, who played a big role in trying to get animals into politics uh, in the 1980s. And um, the actual scene, of course, was one of the McDonald's adverts you know, the kind of uh, hamburger patches of this kind of stuff, the idea that hamburgers grow uh, like vegetables. Upside down and completely helpless, they're lugged unceremoniously off to the cannery. At this point, it's just as well a turtle only sticks his neck out once. Hmm, seems he recognizes a friend. Well, he'll soon be in the soup himself. So I don't think the industry would say that nowadays. On a Saturday morning, they have nothing better to do but protest about animals, you know? 500 rads of gamma radiation, delivered at the rate of 50 rads per day, failed to degrade the performance of the test animals in either accuracy or reaction time. A definite advantage in civil defense, military, and space flight operations. And somehow, one gets the impression that the chimpanzee is proud of his contribution. And that's the end of the um, audio. And again, really interesting kind of um, attitudes being shown in, in that, being proud of their contribution, as though they've got anything <laughs> to do with it. And then just at the end, there's just an advert for the uh, DVD. So I thought I'd leave that in. Again, might stop me getting um, some kind of ban or some kind of copyright thing. So all your DVD people. <laughs> I suppose that's what I've got to say. Right, let's switch this back to this. So, um, as I said then, um, the animals film is seen as not as graphic um, and as relentless as Earthlings or, or um, Dominion. Um, but interesting, uh, a lot of people will know Benny Malone, and he said that he found it the way around. He, he found this one, uh, this film was a bit more disturbing than those, um, probably kind of the reverse of the reason, I, I suppose. So it features cartoons, as I said, and those interviews and all the adverts um, uh, to break it up and that, and that kind of stuff. Things that I remember about it is there's um, one scene which I've never forgot, forgotten, which is a veal farmer talking about his industry. And he stood there with the veal unit behind him. And he said, this is really good. It's going really well. And we're very pleased with it. Um, you know, the business is going fine. The only thing we don't like is the confining so Sean Feld said, um, what do you mean by confining? And he said, well, we have to be here, you know, seven days a week, twice a day to feed them and all this kind of stuff. So this veal farmer was complaining about confining, but he was complaining about his confinement rather than the other animals, which is, I suppose, pretty typical. And then the other the other bit that I remember is he's, Sean Feld is going around saying, do you, do you eat um, 
animals. I think he's just saying that as an opening kind of thing. And a woman said, uh, well, yeah, I work in a meat packing plant. And Schoenfeld said, um, so what do you feel about that? And she suddenly gets quite defensive. And she goes, uh, well, I've never really thought about it. And so Schoenfeld said, so, well, now that you're thinking about it, wouldn't let her off the hook, as it were. And then she's kind of looking around, see what she can do and said, well, I wouldn't eat cats or dogs. And he says, why? And he, oh, well, they don't, they don't seem very tasty. And so it's really quite in interesting the fact that once she was questioned about what she was doing, it became, uh, you know, very kind of difficult f for her, if you like. So as I said, a lot of groundbreaking stuff in there in terms of film. It was the first time that Debeaking uh, was filmed. Um, and that particular shot of Debeaking is, became quite famous and, and became used over and over again in the, in the movement until we got more modern uh, footage. I'm not going to show you any of it because it's pretty gruesome. And also, again, content warning about language. Um, the Animals film was the first time I ever heard the phrase rape rack. Um, and it was in relation to um, pig um, breeding at the time. And I did a podcast with Harold Brown, who was a farmer and now he's a vegan activist. And I said, um, do you think the, the farmers still use the phrase rape rack? And he said, they do, but they don't publicly anymore. So they might, they might use that kind of phrase amongst themselves, but they know it's not a good PR thing. So they've dropped it um, publicly, um, if you like. In terms of the effects of the, uh, of the film, a lot of people go vegetarian and, and stroke vegan because of it, including people like human rights lawyer, uh, Michael Mansfield, also uh, Elvis Costello, the singer, uh, quite a few others, but those are the two that have uh, been mentioned in, in the blurb, as it were. Okay, now we're moving forward now to the reaction, um, which, which is quite a few years later. This is 2009. And so the director of the animals film was asked to go on the BBC World Service, the radio, uh, to do two shows about the animals film, looking back, as it were, 28 years later. And so these were two World Service specials, and you can you can get them um, uh, by just googling it. I think BBC One Planet, you, you, you'll find them. And his other remit was to report on what he thought was the progress of the animal movement in those 28 years. And it's really evident, really, that Schoenfeld was pretty shocked by the lack of progress. So he was, he was fairly kind of um, upset about the fact that the movement had uh, done so badly. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. I'm trying to remove that, actually. Remove. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's put this back up. All right, just bear with me a second. I've just got to uh, load something else before we continue. Um, there we go. Right, right, okay. Okay, so the One, the one Planet um, specials, um, Schoenfeld interviews quite a lot of people, um, amongst them being uh, food expert, Professor Tim Lang, he was a big voice in Britain at one point. Uh, Eco-feminist uh, uh, Vandana Shiva, uh, author Jane, uh, Joan Denea, uh, human rights lawyer um, Michael Mansfield, as I mentioned before. Also the then head of um, the HSUS, uh, Wayne Pacelli, uh, law professor Gary Francione. And um, I, I was interviewed, I had to go down to uh, a local Dublin radio station to do some taping, but my bit was cut, unfortunately, but never mind. Um, it's very clear, though, in terms of these two programs, the first one is about farming, the second one is, is about vivisection. The first one is, is by far <clears throat> the more interesting from the movement point of view now, in the sense that he was really assessing the progress. And both Mansfield and Schoenfeld are clearly very disappointed about the movement's progress in 28 years. He expected those to be um, you know, much better, much further ahead, if you like. For example, Schoenfeld said um, that the likes of the HSUS and PETA and the RSPCA 
all work with animal user industries to produce tiny reforms that leave the exploitation of other animals, as he puts it, intact. And when they do get these tiny uh, victories, they then claim a victory. And he's very disappointed about this. So I'm going to play you this little clip from that, and you can see uh, what I mean about that. Getting a little bit soft or co-opted in your high-profile role? I think all you need to do is look at the agriculture industry in the United States. They fear HSUS more than any other organization. The Humane Society, like the RSPCA and PETA, has heaped praise on businesses that profit from meat-eating for making small adjustments in their purchasing policies. We've worked with corporations from Burger King well to Denny's to Whole Burger Foods. King, the fast food chain, just saying no to animal cruelty. Margaret Brennan is on the money behind the decision. Burger King making a bold move today. The King moving the suppliers who do not confine their animals in crates or cages. This is going to get Burger King a lot of publicity, a lot of attention. We've worked to establish new standards for procurement policies. BK will start slowly. 2% of eggs will be cage-free. We are determined to charge ahead on all of these fronts. And the new regulations the Humane Society claims as signal victories leave intact the intensive systems of exploitation. Cows, pigs, and chickens consigned to short lives, packed into windowless buildings, then slaughter. I put this point to Wayne Pacelli. I generally disagree with that line of thought. I don't think that it's a minor matter to remove 20 million laying hens in California from battery cages. But they are still confined indoors, aren't they? Well, they, they may be or they, they may not be, but we've had decades of activism and no success uh, until HSUS entered the fray. Right, so as you can see, um, there is a disagreement there between the parties on terms of, um, you know, how good we were doing. This was a time, this was a time when it was the end of the ban the battery cage campaign. And I think that um, the industry kind of sidestepped the movement in a sense because they came up with the idea of the enriched battery cage. And I don't think anybody really um, foresaw that. And so then they had to launch campaigns against the enriched cages. And then it, it came up with the idea of cage free. And cage free then was translated to one big cage. And so this is always the kind of problem uh, with that. I mean, Francione, obviously, you, you'd expect in terms of his contribution to the radio um, thing that um, he was saying that, look, if all that effort in the last 28 years has been put into vegan education, we would have been a long way ahead of just kind of getting rid of the barren battery cages and the idea of that some suppliers would have switched 2% of their eggs to cage free i mean these these are very kind of almost pitiful advances really but th that's where we are uh, in a sense so both programs but particularly the first one as i said about farming is, is a powerful critique of the animal movement i i can't i can't help wondering what schoenfeld would think of the movement right now and i, I still don't think he'd be too impressed in fact uh, we are working uh, for him to be a guest on the, the Animal Rights Show. So if that comes forward, that would be a really kind of brilliant thing. And then finally, we have, again, this is 2009. I took part in a, a, an Animal Rights Establishment Approach commentary. Uh, uh, again, this is still online. You can find this if you go to the site and then look for commentaries. Uh, it might be under podcast. I'm not quite sure. So Gary Francione was there. Uh, Elizabeth Collins from New Zealand was there and, and I was there. And we kind of assessed the, the first part, really, of the, um, uh, of the um, you know, the Schoenfeld radio thing. I remember Elizabeth being very critical of Schoenfeld himself on the grounds that, um, you know, even then, 28 years later, he was still a vegetarian. He'd been a vegetarian since he made the animals film but hadn't moved to veganism. So again, whether <laughs> whether that has changed now, it would be an interesting thing because it would be a bit shocking really if if it if it hadn't, but you know, then again. In in the first one, the the um one about farming, 
he puts himself through a kind of test because he said that he found himself as a vegetarian kind of craving flesh now and again. And so they did a kind of psychological test uh, with him and somebody else uh, to find out what all that. That's really kind of fascinating as well. It's a really, it is really worth kind of worth uh, listening to those two things. And I think they're both only about 28 minutes long. So it's not, it's not too bad uh, in that sense. Right. So that's the animals films. Um, and as I said, I suppose I would still regard it as my generation's earthlings and um, very powerful still is. Uh, the DVD uh, is available um, with its kind of director's cut and the original and all that kind of stuff. Um, and just have a quick look in the chat now. <coughs> As I've said, this is only the second time we're, we're doing this new series and I wanted to make it interactive, but it is a bit difficult to kind of switch to the chat. So I don't know whether I'm just going to have to revisit the chat at the end of each one, something I've got to kind of work on um, a little bit. So, um, yeah, do, do, do. Yeah, spiritual vegan wouldn't want to watch that. <laughs> no. All right. Hello, Laura. How are you doing? I was lucky enough to catch a special cre uh, screening of this film in New York City about 10 years ago. It's my favorite animal rights film to this day. It's really interesting, though, because of the time... Um, it was made as the narrator, which is Judy Christie, the actor, um, obviously reading a script, but um, other animals are, are called it in the film, which probably wouldn't happen now, which is which is interesting. So again, I suppose <laughs> mark that down on the progress side um, of the movement, although um, there seems to be a bit of pushback at the moment um, uh, with that. Other people now defending the idea of calling other animals it again, which is disappointing to say the least. Possibly the most significant moment of the early 80s. Yeah, it was. It does kind of tie in really with um, what we were talking about last time, which was the growth of the anti vivisection movement uh, in Britain. Um, because this was a time, the early 80s, when there was a big surge in activity. And it was a kind of a peak. And some people would claim it was the largest peak we've ever had in the, in the movement. But then, of course, all social movements say, they kind of experienced peaks and troughs. And um, I suppose the last five years we're on the rise uh, again. Um, bomb. We need to revive that group and the concept of the power of the cinema. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I don't think I did it much justice really, but it is interesting, Schoenfeld's rationale for having it shown in cinemas. Um, because Philip uh, Windiat, who is... Um, Used to work, used to write for the Beast, and he was involved in the early days. He was part of the production of the Animals film, but he is the person who kind of interviews Sean Feld in the DVD. And I think it was his first question: you know, Why did why did you want to watch one of these films? Uh, why did you want to make one of these films? And also, what was the score about having it in the in the cinema as well? Um, Colleen, that picture is uh, I don't know which picture it is, but um, you're probably, you're probably right. Um, Okay. All art forms have the power to change the way people think about things. So we desperately need to reclaim that concept of art. Well, I guess people would say, well, films have carried on coming out all the time. And of course, now it's just a question. See, I suppose in one weird way with the internet now, if the animals film was released now, it would just be another film that would kind of people would talk about for a, a you know a few days or a few weeks and then you know there'd be land of hope and glory too or something and so it, it wouldn't have the same impact in the sense that that was the go-to film for ages i mean years uh, in terms of the movement you know and um a lot a lot of um it prompted a, a you know, because because of the things that it revealed it prompted a lot of lines of inquiries uh, by other films, which which was really good as, as well. Yes, that's the that's the 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 pig handler. That's right. Yeah, uh, the use the use of, of of violence, of course. You know, obviously this is the thing when we talk about animal rights violations and we talk about systematic animal use, and um, you do start to 
I mean, you can just go to someone like Gail Aznit's book, Slaughterhouse, to, to see the routinized kind of way that other animals are exploited and killed and have their rights violated. But also, it becomes so routinized that if, for example, another animal falls off the kill line, the, the animal is blamed for slowing the process down and punished for not going to their death as quick as they should have done. Yeah, you know, so that's that's how kind of corrupted these these kind of industries can be, you know. Yeah, Laura, you agree with Benny? Yeah. I, well, I was quite surprised when Benny told me that. Uh, I was quite surprised, but um, I can see the point uh, for sure. And I suppose, um, I suppose the cartoons and the vox pops and everything, because because they break things up. I suppose maybe you're more receptive to the film and you're not kind of, you know, kind of, you know, hiding away from it almost and kind of guarding yourself. So maybe you might remember more because of that. That's, I mean, that'd be an interesting social psychology um, thing as, as well. Uh, one of the things that affected me most in Dominion also uh, wasn't graphic. It was a shot of cars climbing, um, calmly driving past the slaughterhouse not even noticing or caring. Yeah, well, there's a lot to be said for that because, um, you know, you, you do notice. I mean, if, if if we're driving along, if you're driving along a motorway with a vegan, then we'll notice the slaughterhouse trucks and we'll notice the so-called livestock um, transporters and we'll notice the butchers' vans and everything. Nobody else seems to. It, even, even if they've got, as it were, chickens looking out of the slots, and you know, hay flying off the um, off the back of, of the van. It, it still people seem to be um, oblivious um, of it, and and I got that impression when I in my early days in the early eighties, when when we used to go sabbing, I started to notice things like you know the the farms and the vivisection laboratories, and again, you'd think oh, only we would do that, you know that everybody else is oblivious to it and yet we are not responsible for these places because we're not their customers and so the people who as it were oppose them know about them and the people who buy from them it's all oblivious to them it's really weird so um yeah really powerful film it is indeed now have we got any more Yeah, it's it's it, well, you you've got that thing, and again, and again, you could make that argument that uh, Colleen, this is not meant for you. You're a vegan already. There's no need for you to um, watch this film, um, and in fact, you're probably not going to um, learn anything uh, new in it. So, in that sense, there's no there's no point. I mean, on Still Alive, Ronnie and I have talked about you know this thing about some vegans will almost like torture themselves uh, with um, watching films and so, sometimes um i think i think that's also some of the rationale for people to go to the save protests as regularly as they do uh because they they don't need any more footage it's just that you know they they buy into that concept that i have a bit of difficulty with the kind of um, bearing witness thing but um I, it's it's based on that thing well if they're going through it the least i can do is watch but it's it's dangerous um if you do it too much um that's uh thing yeah bernie says we're evolving our language that is true it still needs to be as it were policed uh which is uncomfortable uh but it is part of the kind of reflexivity of social movement that we talk about the language we use on the grounds that we're claims makers so our language is incredibly important you know some people say oh well, you know what well, doesn't matter you know what you say kind of thing well, well it does so um Seems to be right. Um, anything else? Very powerful film. Uh, yeah. I thought somebody said habits. It was Clinton habits. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Language is important. Yeah. That's um, that's our takeaway. Um, our takeaway um, idea for today then okay so as you can see then this is only the second one of this new series and we're still evolving it and 
I need to do better with the, you know, with the chat somehow, but I'm not quite sure how to do it in the sense of kind of going through it fairly concisely without stopping too, too much, but we'll see. Anyway, people, thanks so much for, for joining us. And uh, we are at the beginning of starting our archive. So that's quite exciting in itself. And uh, with that, I shall say uh, goodbye and see you next week. Mm -hmm.